how can we show our students we care without giving them candy or spending a ton of money? That is today's question. Welcome back to the show, Teachers on Fire. My name is Tim Cavey, and it's my mission to warm your heart, spark your thinking, and ignite your professional practice. Our teacher on fire today is Laura Boyd. Laura is a middle school teacher who is passionate about ed tech and SEL. She has presented at the district, local, and state levels, helping classrooms produce superior learning and rich student development. You can follow Laura on X at Technology Laura. Laura, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Are you ready to light it up? Yeah, I'm excited for this opportunity. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure to have you. As soon as I saw this tweet from you, and we're going to put it up on the screen here in a moment, but as soon as I saw this tweet or this post, I guess we should say, the top 10 ways to show kids you care without spending money or buying candy, I thought I've got to have you on and share these ideas with my podcast audience. Just as we get rolling, I want to say, oh, we've got my brother, Andrew Cave. Hello, Andrew. He says, let's light it up. Okay. Well, th thanks for joining us this morning, Andrew. So we've got, and I, I just want to pull up your post for a moment. We've got the list and let's take this down. There it is. And I'm going to read it out. And then Laura, we're going to dig into some of these items together. So we've got number one, greet kids at the door, use their names in quiz and test questions, memorize their pet names, make a positive phone call home, Give stickers, one-to-one -one conferences, allow choice in assignments and activities, play music, free sit, and smile at them a whole lot. And I love that one too. So, Laura, I want to dig in. We won't have time to talk about every single one of these, but I want to dig into some of them, starting with this one, greeting kids at the door. Why is this such a powerful move for every teacher? So I started greeting all of my kids at the door individually at the beginning of the school year. So I wanted to have a strong precedent. And what I have is a piece of paper underneath my classroom um, name. And it says morning greeting. And there's five options. So students can wave. They can say hola. They can dab. They can dance. Or they can give me a hug. And so I greet them face to face, making eye contact. And then some kids decide to give me a hug. Some kids just wave. Some kids smile. And then as they're coming into the classroom, I'm greeting each of them. And it just kind of sets a strong precedent, like that the relationship building starts from the moment that they're entering into my classroom. I love that you're not doing the 25 different greetings. I find that really difficult to try to memorize. <laughs> the, the, the idea yeah. is a little bit intimidating, but they've got these five options. Are some students still choosing dabbing at this point? There are a couple and there are a couple okay. of Fortnite dances and that always makes me smile. Perfect. That is so great. Let's talk about the next one, memorizing pet names. Now that one really made me smile. Have you actually done this and how has it worked out for you? What have you found? Yeah, so this one really took off. I, um, I love my pet myself. So like getting to know the students, I created a Microsoft flip. And on that grid, it was introduce your pet to me or your stuffy. So just in case they didn't have a pet. And so literally all of their dogs and cats were running up on the flip. And then they would introduce their pet to me. And then I just started memorizing their pet's name, talking to them about that and organic conversation. Um, and then even it's gone so far that some of the students will send me pictures of their pet and then I put them on the Google Slides. And so it's just embedded in our culture because that's a part of their lives, a part of my life as well. And um, if the dog got a haircut, sometimes I get an update on that. They went to the groomer. So it's just been really fun to like, you know, get to know my students and their families through their pets. That's so great. And I love the provision that if they don't have a an actual pet, they can bring in a stuffy and mm -hmm. that can stand in. Next one, let's talk about the positive parent phone call home. So I, I think this one is fairly well known around 
teacher Twitter and uh, the the different social media places where teachers hang out. But I want to narrow in here on how do you maximize impact while keeping these phone calls sustainable and on point? Because I think some teachers just get tired at the at the thought of getting pulled into a 30 minute conversation. Yeah, so my vision was that I wanted to make a positive phone call with each of my students' parents off the bat. And so rather having those hard, difficult conversations, if needed be, you know, you don't want your first call to be already like, oh, they're not turning in their homework or I'm having a discipline issue. So the conversations are very short, as in one to two minutes, I kind of have a script. And I only do five a week because just what you articulated. I need something that was manageable for myself. I call during my planning from the school phone and I just start going down my list. I highlight when I'm done. Um, and it just always surprises me that so many parents are just so grateful. You know, thank you for calling. Um, this is the first phone call I've ever received from the school. Um, and being able to speak Spanish, that's been really beneficial. So I can talk in Spanish to the family. Sometimes I just leave a message if they're not there. But, you know, I just introduce myself, say one or two things about their student. Do you have any questions? And that's it. So I think five for me, that has been manageable. Um, and it's every week. And I just highlight as I go down. Um, and it just really helps build community. And I hear a lot of the students, you know, did you call my mom yesterday? You know, my dad told me he talked to you. So I think it matters. And again, it's not punitive. It's not anything negative. It's just, hey, this is me. I'm your child's educator. We're on the same team. I'd like to get to know you. Thank you. Goodbye. Mm hmm. No, I think that is so wonderful. And and for newcomer families, I think sometimes there's a bit of a, a wall almost between them and the school, a lot of questions, a lot of unknowns. And then for them to receive that phone call, establishing some positive connection right off the bat must mean so much. Five is a great rate when I think about one per day, or do you batch them all on one day? Yeah, I batch them all in one day, which yeah. that for me has worked. I always do it on Friday because it kind of for me, it just like gets me in a good mood to like send off the week on a positive note. Um, I think one a day could also work. You know, it really just depends on the teacher schedule. But if you set, you know, a goal and like hold yourself accountable, I think it's definitely manageable. Thank you so much for joining us on this conversation, Teachers on Fire. If you're getting value here, give this video a like. Next question for you, Laura, how can today's ed tech apps and tools help us offer students greater voice and choice in their learning activities? Can you share a recent example of this, particularly when it comes to offering more choice uh, or, or voice, either one, but uh, is there something that has really helped you build those connections in your classroom? Yeah, this is a great question. So I created a Google slide and I called it student choice. And what I did is I had centers up in the classroom and I just set a timer for 40 minutes on the smart board and I gave various tech tools like Quizlet Live, WordArt, Microsoft Flip, Quizzes, Kahoot. And then I also did um, Flip with Play-Doh. And so I told my students that they could pick all the stations. They could stay at one station. They could work pair to pair. They could collaborate um, with me one on one or they could do group work. And so within that 40 minutes, I saw students circulating. I saw some students, you know, staying in some of those ed tech tools a little bit longer than others. But I wanted them to feel like they had the autonomy to go where they thought that they could best learn the content at their own pace and then have some choice to pick who they wanted to work with. And then there were also some that wanted to be independent and I was fine with that too. I felt like that was the best decision for their own learning and I support that as well. Sounds very UDL, <laughs> love that. All the different on-ramps and customized learning experiences available there. Well, another fun item on your list, Laura, is play music. So I'm curious, what kind of music are you playing? What kind of music do your students like to listen to these days? Yeah, so I use Class Dojo. The music there is active, and then there's really a tranquil music setting. And so the one, the active music is a little more peppier, and I kind of do that when we're um, doing the warm-up or the exit ticket. And then the other option is more, um, it's all instrumental, of course, and when we're taking a test or just like some downtime. And I feel like the music really helps students like focus in. Um, and I like my classroom to be a little bit loud and very engaging. So I don't want it to be so quiet that it's like they don't feel 
that they can speak and engage with me and their classmates. So I like the music. Um, I feel that you have to be mindful, obviously, of the lyrics out there. So for me, I just stick with the class dojo. Um, sometimes they like to do the YouTube, like for the holidays, I'll do instrumental jazz music. When we do our Starbucks coffee shop work day, I'll just put jazz music in the background and put a little YouTube video for some ambiance just to switch it up. But they always want to, you know, have music playing for sure. <laughs> We've got Mark Ryan tuning in from the Middle East. He says classic rock. Well, Mark, I, I don't know how I don't know how classic rock would work in my middle years classrooms, but if you're actually able to use that, that's impressive. I know in my practice, usually um, one of the hits seems to be Minecraft. It's just so relaxing, and it it sort of touches some really positive associations for a lot of my learners. So that's been fun. You've got another item here, Laura. And that is maybe a no-brainer in some ways, but you say smile a whole lot. Would you agree that there is sort of a virtuous cycle here that the more we smile, the more enjoyable our students become? <laughs> yeah, for me, I think energy is infectious. So if right. I'm in the classroom standing at the door, you know, smiling, good morning, when I'll see us giving hugs, and then I'm getting excited about my content, I feel that it is very infectious. And then on the contrast, if I'm feeling tired or overwhelmed, you know, that negative energy can seep to my students. So I do my best to be happy and smile at them, get to know them, because I really do feel like it helps with the learning. You know, sometimes the content isn't always fun. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, that is what it is. At school, it's difficult at times. But when you're smiling and you feel relaxed and excited about it, I do feel like that totally transcends. You know, I think our classrooms, they read the temperature of the room. They know different teachers have different um, mannerisms and your nonverbal can really share a lot. And so I think when you get hyped up, especially with middle school, um, that's just the perfect age, I feel like, and that fits my personality. So I think, you know, don't forget to smile even that first day. I feel like to the very end, you know, test days, just even if there's snowstorm outside or you had a fire drill, you know, the kids are going to pick up on that energy and you feel like you have a lot of control as an educator to set that tone for your students. And so I think that's one of the beauties of education. You know, you have the power to make someone's day. I love everything you just said there. And I think it's so important to just come in and hype it up a little bit. I mean, it doesn't have to be over the top. I'm not really an over the top person, but I love to walk into a room and say, what is up 5B or what is up 6L and look around the room and I'm smiling and I'm connected with kids. And right off the top, it's sort of like, it, there's a little bit of acting some days. I mean, that's part of the role, I think, of teaching that we're not always feeling exactly what we're performing. But I think there is something about that psychology of projecting this positivity, projecting this idea that, man, we love being with these kids. We find these students really fascinating <laughs> and, and enjoyable. And we're excited about the content. And Man, when we can project those things, I think they continue to self-fulfill in a way. Uh, we've got another comment here. Let's see. Uh, Mark says, I always smile with the lack of snowstorms. Okay. Yeah. No snowstorms where he is. <laughs> and Andrew is saying, I love the greeting by name and the positive acknowledgement, giving value identity, showing you are happy to be there and they should be also. Nice. Thank you, gentlemen, for tuning in this morning. Laura, you've written on Edutopia a number of times, so congratulations on that. Uh, you've been featured several times there. You've written about the intersection between ed tech and SEL, which I think is sort of underreported. What do you think teachers miss about this connection or the opportunities here? Yeah, so I hear a lot like, I don't have time for that, or does that really work? Um, that you know, I have so many standards to cover. And I feel that for me, that was a game changer. And I truly believe that. And as a practitioner of SEL, I believe it for my own life, for my family's life and for my students. And so that's why for me, you know, spending the first five minutes of our bell ringer and we do a check in with a Google form of emojis. How are you feeling today? And they have the ability to articulate. I'm happy, mad, sad, frustrated, tired, excited, nervous. And I just felt like to create that open, safe space for students to be able to, you know, share how they're doing. And there's multiple ways you can do that. And there's so many great resources out there. So I always felt like you get that time back um, just to be able to build those relationships and talk about, you know, because these are human beings we're talking about. So the emotions do play 
a huge part, especially in middle school. They're going through so much um, transition and they're growing in all different ways, physically, emotionally. So I just feel like, yes, it's important. I've seen the benefits for me in my classroom, um, just doing brain breaks and implementing mindfulness strategies. Um, it just really pans out for a positive um, classroom culture. And I think it has helped me be a stronger teacher and leader um, with my colleagues, with myself, with the parents that I serve, of course, my students. So I think it is worth the time and investment. And, you know, you can start small. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. You know, you don't have to do morning meeting every single day. You could do it once a week or play a brain break, you know, every other day, just implement some of these strategies that really can positively help student outcomes. I think I missed a question here, Laura. So I want to jump back to this one. You are a strong advocate for education technology as a means of supporting and representing learning. It's in your name, technology, Laura. So I'm, I'm wondering, you've already dropped some great apps and tools out there, but is there anything else that is exciting you about supporting apps or ed tech tools that are supporting student learning this year? Yeah, so two tools I want to highlight. One is Factile, and that is a free online Jeopardy game. My students love this. It really boosts student engagement. And so you can either create your own Jeopardy or use all of like the question banks that are provided for you. Um, I give all my students whiteboards and Expo markers um, and then project the Jeopardy on the smart board. And it's just really engaging because all the students are participating and then they can buzz in. And so that's really fun. It makes a little noise. And then it's great for checks for understanding. So I get all of the data, like if they wrote the um, correct vocabulary term, they hold up all their answers um, and they get really competitive. You know, they want to buzz in first. So that's one tool is Factile. And the second one is Quizzes. And um, that's been out there for a while. But I've really been using Mastery Peak. And what I like that is because it's so data driven. I hit the mastery goal at 80 percent. And so as soon as are competing like to hit that 80 percent, they're competing on accuracy and speed. But it's kind of like a team effort. You know, they want to climb their mountain with their little emoji thing. And then um, if they meet that 80 percent, like that shows me in the class, like, okay, we're ready to move on. So I really like that because I think it has a lot of different features. And then obviously they have the live mode where the students compete individually. There's the homework mode, the test mode where it grades it for you, and then the team mode. So there's just so many different ways you can integrate quizzes. And I feel like for me, I just get the, I guess most data question by question, student by student, and then class accuracy. So I really can target like, okay, we all understand question one, but I need to review question two with these students or question three, oh, we didn't do successful, so I need to go back and reteach. So those are my two favorite tools right now. That was such a solid breakdown. I feel like I'm going to have to go back and listen to everything you just said there. Factile and quizzes. Quizzes, if you don't know, is just dominating the quiz platform space. And in, in terms, I don't know what their market share, so to speak, is, but they are adding so many incredible features. And I need to become more familiar with Mastery Peak and everything you just described there. But I know just all the AI tools that they've been adding. Kyle Nemus, he is he is a must follow on X. So. Uh, big shout out to Factile and Quizzes, not sponsored. <laughs> Thank you so no, much, Laura. <laughs> um, Teachers on Fire, if you are enjoying this conversation, consider adding the Teachers on Fire YouTube channel to your Monday morning commute and joining us there. Laura, outside of education, as we start to transition into some rapid fire questions, what's another area of learning for you? What is it that ignites your passions when you leave the classroom and brings you alive as a human being? Yeah, so just being able to use social media in a positive space, you know, to be able to connect with other passionate and professional educators like yourself, being able to equip teachers with resources that I feel like really work in the classroom since I'm in the classroom every single day. So that ignites my passion, just being able to share my love for ed tech with other um, like-minded individuals. And that helps me stay motivated as well. Share about one personal habit or a productivity hack that contributes to your success and keeps your fire burning. I mean, as we were talking off air, you when you develop this sort of technology person role at your school, that can be quite fun, but also quite demanding. So how do you keep it all going? Yeah, so one thing that I really love um, is within Gmail, just schedule emails. So I'm in a couple different committees and serve in different capacities. And so just to keep my productive 
productivity on point and to make sure I don't forget to send an email or whatnot. I just love that schedule button, you know, hover over, send, schedule. I can schedule a time. You know, I don't want to interrupt someone's personal time on the weekend. So I'll just schedule like Monday, 8 a.m. or I have to inquire input from other my colleagues for a committee that I serve. So I'll put that out within timely manner or to send a follow up email. So I really love that schedule send. And it prevents those ongoing weekend conversations that none of us really want to get pulled into. Right. So that's an important one. Laura, when it comes to Education X, formerly Twitter, tell us about someone we should follow there and share why they've been inspiring you lately. Yeah, so I have to shout out Miss Wendy Turner. She is a teacher from Delaware. A yeah, she won Teacher of the Year. I'm not sure what year, um, but I've been following her for a while. Um, she just wrote a new Edutopia article too. Um, I just love her passion for SEL. She's on LinkedIn as well. So Wendy Turner, just awesome educator, very passionate within that space. Um, and I want to shout her out former guest here on the podcast and coming up in a couple of episodes as well. So Wendy Turner, absolutely. Thank you for for hyping her up in advance. I appreciate that. Tell us about a book that is uh, one of your favorite, maybe one of your all-time faves, or it's been on your recent reading list and, and let us know why you recommend it. Oh, wow. That's a really good question. Um, I love The Giver. I know that's not an educator book, but I just sure. love um, Lois Lowry. I loved all the books written um, by her. So just a powerful book that really impacted my life. Um, even as an adult, I, sometimes, you know, you read books in different seasons and it might resonate, you know, when you're a child, adolescent. So I just love that book. <laughs> For some reason, that movie is so powerful to me. I've seen it like five times and it still makes me cry. It's crazy. (laughs) On the subject of podcasts and as a support to my work here, Laura, who is one educator or speaker that you think I should interview on the Teachers on Fire podcast? Well, I think you should. I don't know if you have, but um, George from Team Flip, he works there. I'm super supporter of educators always been like you know advocate for me and my students he even um did a zoom call while we were during covid and talked about working with microsoft um and just his career so that might be something that you could explore further down the road all right george from team flip formerly flip flipboard flip grid uh, yes or flip grid i i knew <laughs> any so flip many. I knew Flipboard wasn't quite right. Uh, Flipboard is actually something else, but Flipgrid, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, and I used to be a big fan. I used it at my previous school. We, I'm in a, a seesaw school now, so they're sort of redundant, but I appreciate Flipgrid a lot, or, or Flip, as it's now called. Laura, as we're wrapping up here, just for fun, what are you streaming these days on Netflix, Prime, Disney, whatever it is that you're watching in your free time? Well, true confession, I watch Love is Blind on Netflix. Okay. Hey, you're not the only one. You're not the only one. (laughs) Full transparency, and I enjoy it, and that's all I'll say. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Laura, this has been a blast, and you've brought full value, lots of good things for us to think about. As we start to sign off here, what are the best ways for the Teachers on Fire community to follow you and connect with what you're all about? Yeah, so if any educator or non-educator wants to follow me on all my social media handles on X, Instagram is at Technology Laura. At Technology Laura is pretty simple, folks. Thank you so much, Laura, again. And thank you for joining this broadcast, Teachers on Fire. Please support the podcast by liking the video wherever it is that you are tuning in. Or if you are on the audio-only experience, go ahead and subscribe to the podcast there, and I would be so grateful. Well, thank you again, Laura, for showing up and dropping by with a a podcaster, perhaps, that you hadn't connected with much before. But thank you for your trust in me and Teachers on Fire. I'm your host, Tim Cavey. Grateful again that you decided to spend some of your day listening to this podcast. If you enjoyed the content you heard today from Laura Boyd, make sure to connect with at Technology Laura on X, Instagram, and YouTube. Yes, YouTube, right, Laura? In the meantime, keep sparking your thinking and igniting your practice, and I'll meet you next week right here on the Teachers on Fire podcast. Take care, everyone. Have a great week. Bye-bye.